Hello and welcome to this review of my Sony BKE9400 keyboard. This keyboard, as you can probably tell from its colourful keycaps, was part of a video editing system, which almost always have a confetti of keycaps like this. Now, this seems to be a convention of some sort among video editing professionals still to this day, and you can even buy coloured stickers for media editing shortcuts that you can stick on the keyboard. The BKE9400 keyboard belonged to the BVE9100 linear edit system. I imagine it was sold mostly during the 90s and it was built around a 32-bit processor and came with 3.5 inch floppy drives. The Sony BVE platform was used a lot by the BBC who were one of its principal users. In fact, the BVE9100 appears to be the BBC version of the BVE9000 which was the main system. To clarify, a video editing keyboard like the Sony is not the same as a character generator, such as the Chiron 4044 or the Deco Fast Action, both of which I've covered before. Those are very specifically for inserting flat or animated text into video streams, often in so-called lower thirds, while video editing keyboards are a much broader thing. They're usually easy to visually distinguish, like I said, video editing systems usually came with multicolored keycaps, while character generators were not quite as colourful, but tended to have way more buttons on them. The Deco, for example, has 162 buttons, and that doesn't even include Windows keys. Here's a picture of a test suite built for the BBC that includes a prototype BVE9100 and also a rather monstrous Aston character generator console, although this doesn't really count as a keyboard anymore, I think. The BVE system was brought in to replace the older Electra system that the BBC used, which looked like this, and as a result of its apparently good sales, second-hand BVEs are not uncommon. The BVE system could be ordered with either this one, the so-called ASCII keyboard, which includes a full QWERTY alphanumeric block, or the dedicated keyboard, which is mainly just a large macro pad with a scroller on it, intended for multi-purpose suite. The macro pad thing belonged to the BVE 900, although this is again the BBC version, which was labelled BVE 910 instead. The 910 is the smallest and easiest to find in the BVE series, bigger models are much rarer, getting this 9100 for a non-ridiculous amount of money actually took a while. Other models in the series included this one, the BVE 2000, which was also a sizable fellow, but the BVE 9100 appears to have been the biggest in the family. A non-ASCII version also existed, called the BVE 9100P. Now, to clarify, the keyboards themselves specifically use the BKE model code, while the BVE model designates the entire system. For all intents and purposes, BKE9400 and BVE9100 identify the same model of keyboard, though. Now, I know it looks smaller on video than it is in reality, but it is in fact 62 centimeters wide and 26 centimeters deep, or eight square cartoony cat feet in imperial units. In other words, it's goddamn huge. Look at this, compared to the length of my arm. It's, it's ridiculous. Compare that to an IBM battleship and you can quickly see we're not talking a wimpy little 60%. This is some real keyboardage right here. By the way, yeah, getting all this big stuff to fit on my desk and in frame is a challenge. It is also far heavier than you might give it credit for. While the BVE 910, also known as the BKE 2010 by the way, has an all plastic case and weighs in at almost two and a half kilos, which is quite impressive. This thing isn't exactly small either by the way. It's more than twice the size of my backup TKL keyboard as you can see. But the BVE 9100 has an all metal case and weighs 5.1 kilograms, which which is a quarter again as much as the battleship, and that's the fifth or so heaviest keyboard I own. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ licking tadpoles, this thing doesn't fuck around. It's nuclear. In fact, after the IBM 5251 beam spring keyboard, which only just outweighs it at 5.2 kilograms, and the Chiron aircraft carrier at 8 kilos, which is kind of in a league of its own to be honest, it's the heaviest keyboard I own. It also comes with a foam wrist rest built into the keyboard, which you can sometimes see kind of crumbled off, but this one's still in perfect condition, thankfully. It's nice, I like it. 
I bought this keyboard off of eBay a while ago for the tidy sum of $75, which is way more than I usually spend on a keyboard. But then again, many of these BVE keyboards, even the small ones, come with ridiculous price tags online. And considering this is such a cool model, I didn't mind for once. Plus, shipping was very cheap as it came from Germany. So, yay! I think one of the reasons I might have gotten it cheaply, which is the same reason I got the other BKE cheaply, is that this is the Omron model. While the BKE series is more well known for coming with a unique, non-capacitive version of Topra switches. Those are based on conductive domes and are said to be far snappier than stock Topra switches. This even led to the development of aftermarket single Topra domes that you could put in your Topra keyboard to enhance that tactility to the snappiness of these domes, which is similar to that of B TC dome at slider. They come in four weightings, light, stiff, ridiculous, and just plain silly. I covered these in a video ages ago, check it out if you're interested. I'll be honest, I was originally trying to get the Topra model to show it in that BKE dome video actually, but I guess these Omrons are interesting to show too. I didn't even know they could come with Omrons, but they're actually easy to distinguish by the lock light windows in the keycaps. These Omrons are a version of their B3GS switches, which are similar in build to Alps SKCM switches, but they're not the more well-known amber turbo clicky ones which I've covered before, but the less well-known white tactile version. The key feels pretty interesting, I've never felt anything quite like this before. The weighting feels kinda medium stiff and it has a subtle but noticeable tactile bump that's rather low down. The bump is somewhat sharp for a tactile switch and comes across as rather balanced, a bit like Alps. It's not super tactile though. It's fairly smooth and doesn't bind, which is impressive considering how heavily this keyboard appears to have been used. Note that because of protocol weirdness, I couldn't exactly test it in daily usage though. I mean, it's not exactly USB plug and play. It's especially the low position of the tactile bump that makes this switch feel so strange. It begins about halfway the key travel and feels like it ends not far before the end. Again, I've never felt anything like this before. It's not bad necessarily, it just feels unusual. The keycaps are kind of medium thick-ish PBT with very small and thin die sublimed lettering. It's a little bit pixelated in places so to speak, so not super even and like I said the keyboard must have seen a lot of use because the key tops of a lot of the keycaps have worn away into a mirror-like polish. This takes a while to do with PBT, longer than it does with ABS, but it will eventually happen. So I guess that the system this came from was well loved, as one tends to say in the second hand world. In fact, the keyboard was okay, but not exactly super clean, and as you can see there is still some schmutziger scheiße on the edges of the keycaps. Maybe I should clean it properly sometime. You can also see that specifically the white keycaps have lettering that's bleached over time into a kind of brownish colour. Maybe it's some kind of additive to make the keycaps this white. I think the very small font size and thinness of the legends don't really help in this regard either. They're Alps mount, so you can use them in an Alps board if you want, but the profile is different from most Alps caps, which tend to be OEM profile, which is taller. The Topra version's keycaps are actually Topra compatible though, which is why every once in a while you see someone who's decked out a capacitive Topra board with these keycaps, which can look pretty kick-ass. There are quite a few specialty legends as well, obviously, considering it's a specialty keyboard. Because of the tiny font size, it's rather hard to read some of them actually. The alphanumeric area is absolutely full of secondary, tertiary and sometimes even quaternary legends ranging from long to short, and many of them I have no clue as to what they mean, such as Backdoor set, Putunki key, man or man, and I particularly like the save BS key <laughs> as well. The layout is also rather unusual, although it's still got a staggered QWERTY base in a normal position to work with, so unlike last week's Teller keyboard, you could probably use it as a normal keyboard. It's got some typical Japanese traits such as a one half unit extended right side with an ISO style enter key and single unit, well now it's one and a half unit, backspace, or rather ret key, as well as a split right shift on the right. But it's split on the inside, which means that I keep pressing this key instead when I want to press shift, and that's a bit annoying. I guess I'd have to reprogram that one. 
Note also the rather depopulated bottom row and the lack of old keys, let alone Windows ones. Also unusual is that the caps lock key becomes two keys, control on the left and this thing here next to it on the right, while caps lock goes where tab normally lives, which is absent from the board. Above that is an init key. You'll note that this side of the board has also been extended by half a unit, by the way. There's also a bunch of special command keys in a bank on the left here, a bunch of P and AUX keys here with built-in lock lights, and eight big F keys above that. And on the right, there's a combined NAV cluster and numpad with a fair amount of weirdness. The calculator buttons are in a non-standard order and position, and the arrow keys are above it, which makes them rather inaccessible. Although admittedly, when I do video editing, I never use the arrow keys either. Instead, I guess you're supposed to rely on this massive wheel for navigation. It turns freely and smoothly, and it has a depression in it, which is presumably so that you can finger spool it like this, a bit like an old rotary telephone. If I could get this working, I can imagine this would work great as a video editing keyboard. At the moment, I have to keep using the mouse wheel to move and zoom in or out instead, which actually landed me a short bout of RSI at some point. Now that I know I got it from that motion of scrolling, which puts heavy strain on uh, this muscle here, I just take a break every 10 or so scenes, so it's fine now and I have no problems at all. But I can see why someone would want a wheel like that for their video editing, especially if they're doing it all day. Plus, it looks kick-ass. If I know what I was doing and was less lazy, I could convert it for use in a PC, I guess, but I don't and I'm not, so I can't use it right now. Besides, I have so many boards that would be worthy of an adaptation. This one does, however, have quite a presence. With its ruggedly good looks, <laughs> you'd think I'm describing a male model here, and colourful keycaps, back to business, I'm sure it would be a nice desk mate to everyone, provided you have a giant desk, of course. <laughs> That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.